uh, to whoever is already logged on, just quickly uh, introduce the, the panel um, without saying too much. Um, so I'm a Ron Smoji, plastic surgeon in uh, Toronto and at North York General Hospital. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Glika Martu um, at uh, Queen's um, at, in Kingston, um, Ontario. We have uh, Thomas Constantine at uh, Humber Hospital in Toronto and uh, Dr. Melinda Musgrave at uh, St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. And we are going to uh, talk about um, how to prepare uh, before and after, but really how to prepare for uh, the breast reconstruction journey. That's, uh, that's the plan. We're gonna hope to answer um, as many questions as possible. We've also got a few topics that um, we thought might be helpful. So we'll, we'll go through those as well. So, um, uh, so um, okay, so let's, um, I think we're, I don't wanna answer any questions until we're officially at 9.10, but, um, but we can talk for, for a minute maybe um, about uh, the consultation, right? So I think a lot of the people that are uh, watching the session and, and um, taking advantage of Broad Day are uh, coming up to or have just had a consultation. And so there's a lot that people can do uh, to prepare and maybe make their consultation more uh, valuable. So um, why don't we start with that? Um, uh, Dr. Martu, what, what do you suggest for patients uh, getting ready for consultation? That's a great question. I mean, it's a difficult time. They have a lot of um, a lot in their mind trying to prepare for surgery. Obviously, if this is immediate reconstruction, there's the added um, stress of thinking about their cancer and their treatment. But um, it's uh, when they're thinking about reconstruction or considering it. Um, Sometimes there's a friend or there's somebody who's gone through it. So if you do have somebody who's gone through it, I would advise you to speak to them and find out a bit about their experience. Um, I would also advise you to log on to your, maybe to a website that your surgeon has, if the surgeon has one or the hospital that the surgeon is working at. There may be a website on uh, breast reconstruction and the program to find out a little bit more about what's offered. Uh, and, then, and then, I mean, in terms of um, websites, uh, there's many of them and it's difficult sometimes to navigate through the internet but the i mean there's good good information on the american society of plastic surgeons i believe that the canadian collaboration on breast reconstruction may still be up as a website so you know don't go i would advise not to spend a lot of time on the internet if you don't think you can find good information maybe talk to a friend and read on your surgeon and i'm, I'm going to throw in one of the patient um questions here uh, which uh, apropos to preparing for consultation about um, does uh, you know your your um, institution have a uh, session that's done as a group or an education session so um, what do you want to deal with that one and then we'll just pass it around how do you guys teach your patients just very quickly so we used to have that before covid i would bring patients about four to six of them and do a group session give them a powerpoint presentation on the different options on advantages disadvantages unfortunately with covid we can't do that the plan is to put them online now and so that patients have access so before they're booked they can go online and uh, watch the presentations come informed and um, at humber do you guys have a group uh, session or how do you prepare patients uh, in different ways, uh, we have uh, tend to individualize the meetings. So some consultations in plastic surgery are shorter, others are longer. The breast reconstruction consultations are definitely longer because there's many things to address. Uh, there's many concerns. And uh, as Dr. Martu was saying, sometimes when the diagnosis is quite, uh, quite recent, uh, there's uh, a lot of things happen very quickly uh, from the oncology standpoint, but also the plastic surgery referral and global treatment plan, which may or may not include reconstruction. So we tend to see people quite early. Uh, and we do a lot of immediate reconstruction in our hospital. In terms of general uh, counseling, especially when there is more time, uh, we have different resources, a lot of materials from uh, events such as this one, especially when you know, we can do them in person. Uh, we have a lot of pamphlets, brochures, and resources. Uh, but I meet uh, individually with every single patient. And in non-COVID times, oftentimes, uh, we have friends and family members that are that are present, uh, significant others, and uh, that helps because the consultations cover a lot of information. 
and it's also a, a very stressful time for everyone, not just the patient, but everyone around them. The diagnosis of cancer is always, uh, it's always very heavy. So we preferentially see uh, patients and offer them an individualized treatment plan, which combines the different, uh, takes into account and combines the different uh, treatments that they'll require, whether it be on the surgical oncology side with their general surgeon, uh, radiotherapy, medical oncologists, of course, us in plastic surgery that uh, perform the reconstructions. And we also give um, a good amount of consideration to getting the potential reconstruction because not everyone is a candidate, but a lot yeah. of people are. So, yes. um, can you just, just speak, up? I, we can hear you, but, yeah. but not, I mean, don't worry, we heard all that, but, but if you speak up a little bit more, it'll be a little bit clearer, I think, for some of the people listening. Okay, yeah. thank you. So in a nutshell, I was saying that we individualize the consultations. We meet one-on-one -on -one with the patients in general, but especially during COVID times. Uh, and it's also important to um, get a sense of what the reconstructive goals might be. Because it's, uh, even if people have, for example, oncologic needs that might be similar, their reconstructions might be very, very different based on uh, their occupation, their sex, because men get breast cancer too. Uh, and what they would like to have out of the reconstruction in terms of form and function. So it's very important to do it on a case-by-case -case basis, even though generalized information can be given uh, to, to larger groups. Um, Dr. Musgrave, do you want to add anything in terms of preparing? There, there are specific questions coming up with regards to the consultation that I'll ask, but just in general, how you um, uh, hope that your patients could prepare for their consultation? I meet with everybody individually because as, as uh, Thomas has said, uh, no two breast reconstructions are the same. Two women can have the same operation, but look completely different because their bodies aren't the same. And choice depends on a lot of things, not just the cancer and not just your anatomy, but on your lifestyle. So I encourage people to think about uh, what their goal of reconstruction is, what they want to achieve, how much time they want to commit to it, and most importantly, I encourage them to bring a second pair of ears and eyes with them so that they can have someone else to help either write down the questions or um, have them have a discussion with each other first and come with their list of questions. I think if you have more people at the consultation, uh, even with COVID, most hospitals will allow you to have one extra person come to your consultation. I think it's helpful to have a second person there to help you navigate so you don't forget to answer your key questions. Yeah, and I, I think the only thing I would add to that, because it's an issue these days, is given that we're a bit restricted in hospitals, um, I, some of you may see patients in your private offices, but in hospitals, a little restricted. So, you know, we've been doing a lot with uh, FaceTime, having a, having a patient's family member or friend on a FaceTime, uh, or even just on the phone, so they can still be that extra set of ears and um, support. Um, some of the questions are related, you know, specifically to um, weight, you know, do, do patients need to lose weight before surgery, how long to wait um, before or after having a baby for surgery, things like that. So maybe we can talk for a minute about um, maybe a little bit about the difference between immediate and delayed reconstruction and how some of those big life decisions are, are impacted. I, we can start again with um, Dr. Martu. Uh, sure. So, I mean, in terms of the weight specifically, um, if, you, if you were to look at the Cancer Care Ontario guidelines, there are two main contraindications for reconstruction, according to those BMI over 40 and overall medical profile. I mean, breast reconstruction, we want it to be something safe for the patient. We want to make people's life better. So we want to make sure that the type of surgery we offer uh, will fit well with the overall medical profile, profile of the patient and will not put the patient at risk. So for immediate reconstruction, obviously, there's a bit of a time constraint. It's difficult to see a patient who you're trying to do, offer surgery within a few weeks and tell them to lose weight. Uh, but in general, I do have some, and every surgeon might have different criteria, uh, but I do like uh, my patients to have, a, I prefer that the BMI doesn't exceed, doesn't exceed, um, I would say if I can offer, if I can put a number about 35, maybe in immediate setting, 32 um, for delayed. So if it is delayed reconstruction and the, the BMI is high, I do recommend that patients lose weight. Um, it just makes everything safer, especially if we're going to do um, a used tissue from the body and do autologous reconstruction. 
Um, and uh, so as far as the weight is concerned, th there are some limitations and sometimes it's useful to lose weight and prepare for the surgery. Uh, again, it depends on the type. Uh, I'll just tackle the weight and then I don't know if anyone else has something on that. Okay, D Dr. Constantine, anything to add to um, preparing uh, physically for surgery? Um, I think uh, Dr. Martu is, is very much uh, correct. Patient selection is very, very important. Um, obviously, with a diagnosis of, of cancer, you have uh, no control there, but you can control things in terms of uh, the reconstructive options that are available. Very broadly speaking, um, I think my patients know this very well because I, I mention at every uh, initial consult. I tell people very broadly that there's basically three options in reconstruction. And the first one that I mention is not to do reconstruction. And I mention this because they need to know that it's elective. Even though there's many benefits to having breast reconstruction in the right patients, part of what all of Broad Day is about to raise awareness and to understand your options better, whether it's immediate or delayed. Some patients are not good candidates for various uh, medical issues. They might have expectations that are not realistic. And they also need to know because uh, they're going to meet other patients and events as this one in waiting rooms, waiting for an ultrasound, waiting for an MRI. They're going to see other patients that might have uh, cancer or cancer sequelae and it helps to understand that everybody is a bit different and there are some people that didn't have reconstruction because they didn't want it there are some people that don't have reconstruction because there's other issues and it helps if uh, people are understanding of it so I think education is key and the other options that I give them aside from no reconstruction uh, is also that some of the things that were spoken about earlier in terms of uh implant-based reconstruction or using your own tissue. So these are the three main categories. None, implant-based, your own tissues, or a combination. And, and Dr. Musgrave, um, anything to add there? And also I'll ask another question. Um, do you ever talk to patients about uh, maybe a stage one operation that's a little bit simpler as opposed to um, no reconstruction at all so that they can get um, healthier if they have other health problems or are significantly overweight or um, have a big life event coming up? Are, th are there things that you can do that are not uh, no reconstruction? So I, I don't have BMI requirements. Literature is pretty <laughs> clear that as long as a patient is overall healthy, their BMI is not a major determinant in getting reconstruction, but it is a major determinant in having complications. So if patients are accepting of the potential complications they can have related to their BMI, particularly with autogenous tissue, um, then I, I don't have any real restrictions. I want them to be healthy. Um, and again, sometimes it's very, it's very easy to say lose weight. It's a very difficult thing to do, particularly in the frame of having cancer. Um, so um, as long as they're healthy, they understand the risks. I don't restrict by BMI. I do not, however, operate on smokers. And so if there's someone who is a smoker and they're having a delayed reconstruction, I'm unlikely to operate them on them in a delayed manner unless they stop smoking. With immediate reconstruction, all you can do is try to give some guidance and try to help them through that process. And again, let them know their, their um, comp potential complications from smoking with respect to reconstruction. In terms of doing staged procedures, I'm more likely to offer staged procedures for people um, who have already had or are planned to have radiotherapy. So I think about things that I can do um, either just after radiotherapy or just before radiotherapy to maybe make the a wound bed better. So particularly women who've had uh, delayed reconstruction with radiotherapy, who have very thin, very compromised skin flaps because of the radiotherapy itself, uh, I've not uh, um, often gone in and done a one stage on those patients. I've usually done things like maybe do some fat grafting initially to prepare the bed before doing something else or even fat grafting in a tissue expander. I think, again, it depends on the patient and their goals of surgery and what they're willing to accept and not accept in their outcomes. And I think those are three things patients really need to think about when they come for reconstruction. Okay. Um, there are um, a few questions coming in about, um, you know, the, the fear of a bigger operation versus a smaller operation. And I guess from the previous um, uh, talks, the, the keynote speakers, uh, you know, maybe uh, using your own tissue like an abdominal flap uh, versus an implant reconstruction and some of the fear about 
um, the recovery. So I, I don't know that we're going to spend too much time specifically talking about what recovery is like, but maybe how to prepare um, for that. If we can talk a little bit about how patients can um, get ready mentally, physically, even prepare their homes. Let's put out a few things that, that we've found have been helpful for our patients. So go in the other order this time, Dr. Musgrave. So I tell them, take the guidelines that you're told about your recovery time with a grain of salt. Not everyone's gonna be ready in three weeks. Not everybody's gonna be ready in four weeks. So be prepared to be there a little bit longer in case you do unfortunately have a complication. You know, if you tell your boss you're going to be away from work for four weeks and you come back at three, you're a superhero. If you tell your boss you're going to be away for three weeks and you're away for six weeks, then everybody wonders what's going on with you. So always be prepared to be a little bit longer on the recovery side and give yourself the appropriate time for you to heal. Not what the average time is, but what the appropriate time is for you to heal. And that may be a little bit longer. Um, Dr. Constantine. What can we add to that? I agree. I think the um, expectation shouldn't be set too high because it's an added stress. Your body's going to heal the way it's going to heal. And like we mentioned earlier, if patient selection is good, you're comfortable with your surgeon and there's a good procedure that's picked for you, things usually go quite well. Um, of course, there can be complications, but if you make the best possible decisions, things tend to align themselves well. I think it's good not to add the added stress of an earlier premature return to work. And I tell some of my patients sometimes, um, this is a very good time to be selfish. There's they've lost a lot or they're losing a lot from their cancer and the treatment. This is time for them. They don't want to have added dif difficulties during their recovery. They've already been through a lot, especially if they have to have other treatments like radiation and chemo, which can carry their own set of complications that have absolutely nothing to do with surgery and are standalone. Um, and I think it's very important to adjust things properly in their lives, both at work, but also at home in their living arrangements and to be able to actually have time to recover with the least amount of external stress possible. Okay. And so that's, so that's on the, on the uh, mental preparation side as well. Um, Dr. Martu, um, physically and or mentally, what can patients do? And I'll just tell you what patient just asked um, uh, one month out from um, breast reconstruction, I'm not sure what kind, what can they do to optimize their, their um, preparedness for, for physically and mentally for surgery? You said a month after? A month they, out, a month uh, before. Sorry. A month before. I mean, obviously, it's been mentioned a couple of times so far that everything is very individualized. So it all depends on what procedure has been discussed, what you've decided to have done. And I'm sure patients, I don't know who's been in what talk so far, but in general, again, things will be individualized, but in general, implant-based reconstruction requires an average of four to six weeks of recovery. Again, these are average times that may be a bit different, whereas uh, tissues include uh, using patients' tissue might be longer, two months, three months. Again, these are general times. So it's good to have, depending on the procedure you choose, to have an idea. So if you choose an implant-based reconstruction, and uh, you're a month before this will happen or a few weeks, uh, you know, you're thinking it's four to six weeks on average. The first couple of weeks, you know, like uh, Dr. Constantine was mentioning, be kind to yourself, like, you know, make sure, maybe, make sure, you know, who's at home to help you out, food is prepared, um, that there's going to be help around uh, the house, you know, um, in case you need to be taken sorry, in case you need to be taken to the hospital for anything, like you have support. And the same thing with autologous tissue we're using, obviously there, there's bigger procedures. So make sure you have lots of support at home. Things are in place in terms of chores. You won't be doing many of those. So planning all that is good, having a bit of a time frame in your mind, but always be flexible about it. Yeah, I think, I think those, are, those are all things that are um, quite often um, the, sorry, the, um, you know, the uh, having that sort of um, uh, time in a life to recover is uh, very important, but it is something that really falls under preparing for surgery. Exactly the things um, that uh, all of you have said in terms of thinking about any of the responsibilities uh, that you have in life and trying to figure out um, who can look after those for you. And if you can do them yourself, that's a bonus, but having that looked after um, and then 
Um, I think uh, Dr. Martu, you mentioned um, also very specific things like where to get information if you need it, if you do have a question or a problem, who to call, um, uh, things like that are, are part of preparing for surgery. Um, on the physical um, side of things, um, we talked. We did talk about smoking, and and so we there's some variability with um, BMI and some difference between immediate and delayed. Um, with smoking, it's that's you know something that we all worry a lot about, and and really the answer is to you know quit immediately upon your diagnosis to make yourself the best possible. Um, candidate for whichever procedure. Uh, somebody asked about vaping. That's an interesting question that I think there's not great literature, but um, probably applies to a lot of people. What what do you tell patients about vaping? Which order are we going? Yeah, <laughs> uh, let's go, Dr. Martu. Sure, I, I agree with you. I mean, I don't know specifically. What I tell my patients is that I would prefer that they don't do any of this. Obviously, in an immediate setting, it's so difficult to add more pressure. Um, but like Dr. Musgrave mentioned, I mean, in delayed settings, I absolutely would like my patient to stop smoking. It's a factor that's modifiable. We don't want this, we want this to be safe for the patient and we just don't want complications. But even in the immediate setting, smoking, I find it difficult. Sometimes I've, you know, any complication I've had has, has had smoking at the root of it. And I tend to sort of talk to the patients that it's really difficult to lose a breast, but then it's also difficult to lose the reconstruction as well. Uh, so, you know, smoking is, and vaping and any other, I sort of put them all together and I try to sort of speak to them that they're not advisable. Okay, and just so for people that are wondering, I think that our general approach to that, obviously the longer the better, but you know, six weeks is kind of That's what right. we really aim for. Um, uh, Dr. Constantine or uh, Dr. Musgrave, anything to add on the on the smoking and vaping preparation? Sure. Um, I'm also aware that uh, well, we don't we don't know exactly what a safe amount, if any, of vaping is. And there's been some reports, especially from uh, from the United States, where there's a lot of associated lung injury and lung pathology. Uh, not necessarily the type that are associated with uh, with smoking tobacco or nicotine products. But uh, we also have to keep in mind that these are some, some of these surgeries are quite demanding. Some of them are quite lengthy and there's a lot of time to be spent under general anesthetics. So minimizing the risk to your uh, lungs and your cardiorespiratory status is, is also part of uh, operative safety. So uh, since we don't know what the minimal safe dose is, uh, we should try to, to minimize it as much as possible, especially in the setting of what is elective surgery. Um. Any any um, other comments, Dr. Musgrave? Or I, I agree with everything that's been said. I think we always have to remember that there's a person at the top of the table helping us deliver excellent patient care, and that's our anesthesiologist. And they really don't like vaping because, as uh, Dr. Constantine said, there's a lot of lung injury that happens. And if you're having, let's say you're having a bilateral DIEP flap, and it's taking a long time and maybe, you know, we're having some difficulty with the micro or there's difficulty with the vessels. The longer you're on the table, the longer they have to try to manage that anesthetic for you for it to be safe. So if they have to worry about something else in terms of causing lung injury, instead of just focusing um, on, you know, uh, sort of the regular parameters around our respiration and ventilation, I think it makes them a little bit stressed on the table. So again, I think we don't know, as Dr. Constantine said, what safe is. I think if you can stop it, you should probably stop it. Okay. Um, can we um, spend a minute talking about uh, some of the things that patients uh, actually need to have uh, ready for themselves before their surgery? That can be prescriptions, garments, um, clothing, uh, anything like that, like maybe, um, you know, let's start with uh, Dr. Constantine, like what are your pre-op instructions um, to, a, to a patient? So there's several things that I mentioned to them after reviewing uh, the procedures in, in detail. Uh, I think more specifically, uh, I think it's important to arrive, even though it's very easy for me to say, uh, as rested as possible and fit to the surgery, whether you have a short amount of time to make that decision in immediate reconstruction or a longer amount of time. You should try to, um, there's other more specific things, for example, like if there's uh, some health concerns that don't stop us from doing a reconstruction that's safe, but that need to be controlled, some things that are very common, like high blood pressure, or especially in, you know, the epidemic of diabetes that we have 
uh, it's important that some of those modifiable or these controllable risk factors are as optimized as possible, meaning uh, your blood pressure should be under control, especially for surgery that's very vascular in nature, like a flap or taking tissue from the abdomen, uh, as well as um, uh, diabetes. The glucose should be under control. The HbA1c should be acceptable. Uh, these are some of the factors that help. Smoking, obviously, we discussed. Um, and I also advise them uh, to, uh, when certain medications that are quite common in some of the population, like blood thinners, can be held uh, for some time uh, safely with clearance from their family doctor or cardiologist or uh, as appropriate. I think that uh, helps decrease some of the perioperative complications associated with, uh, with bleeding, both in implant-based reconstruction and also in uh, autologous-based reconstruction. Okay. Um, any, uh, Dr. Martu, anything else um, that you tell your patients to bring to their surgery, to prepare at their house, uh, I think uh, that was a great list, Dr. Constantine. Um, so in terms of metal garments, I mean, for the um, implant-based reconstruction, I do tell them to bring a soft bra. Uh, obviously, we can't promise a size, uh, but something that, um, uh, you know, there's no wires, something soft just for support. And I usually, I keep my implant patients overnight uh, just to monitor. And the next morning, I'll try it on, make sure there's no pressure on. Uh, for And sometimes for the flat patients, you know, a camisole that's light, something to just wear and uh, to have some support. And again, when they put them on, I check, make sure there's no pressure. That's as far as garments. There's really no other major uh, specific ones. Um, yeah, in terms of the, I think everything else was mentioned um, for preparation for them to bring in um, the hospital. Yeah, so, you know, for, for me, the only thing I add is is the prescription. So I, I do get, not everybody does, but if your surgeon gives the prescriptions before surgery, then, you know, fill those, have them at home. You never need anything in the hospital, but you need them as soon as you get home. Um, so you'd have that ready. If Also, it's just some basic things, right? Comfortable clothing. Um, you know, generally we try, I think in many cases, not to limit, you know, arm movement too much, but obviously there's some discomfort associated. And so, you know, things, clothing that's easy to put on, zippered, you know, um, jackets, sweatshirts, things like that, or front buttons are all much easier than trying to put, you know, a sweatshirt or a t-shirt over, over your head. Um, I think in terms of garments, whether it's an abdominal binder or something to support the abdomen or a bra, uh, it's something I would certainly suggest that everybody is clear um, from their surgeon because it is highly variable and it's highly variable as to whether it's something that you're expected to uh, prepare on your own or something that's provided for you uh, by your hospital or by your surgeon. So it's just something to, to sort of check off your list as you're in your consultation or preparing for um, surgery. Uh, somebody suggested a wedge pillow, which a lot of patients... Um, and I don't usually uh, mention that, but I have heard that from patients and I probably will. Um, a wedge pillow can be uh, helpful to prop patients up, particularly if you've had abdominal-based surgery and it's hard to get out of bed. It's a little bit easier from a slightly elevated um, uh, position. Um, okay, uh, let's talk for a minute, um, just because I, wanna, I do wanna answer some of the questions, although a lot of these are quite surgeon specific, but in terms of preparing, people are asking about medications they need to stop. So one of the big ones is tamoxifen. So many of our patients are on uh, tamoxifen or one of the other hormonal based um, uh, um, medications for breast cancer. Um, do you tell them to stop or do you ask them to discuss it with their oncologist? Is there a consensus on that? Uh, Dr. Constantine, what do you do? Uh, I'm not sure that there's necessarily a consensus because in the literature, people do different things. Uh, I've read people uh, ask to stop uh, approximately one to two weeks before. I think it's always a good idea to have a sense of what the oncologists in your center do and have a discussion with them. So for example, in our center, I met with some of the oncologists and we reviewed it so that we all kind of have the same uh, approach to it. Um, what I do is as I get people to... Um, as some people might know in the audience or not, uh, tamoxifen definitely has a, has a role in, uh, in breast cancer treatment, but one of the potential uh, issues with the medication is that it can slightly increase the risk of clots. And some patients, uh, cancer patients especially, or uh, slightly more obese patients, already have a baseline increased uh, risk of, of clots. 
uh, in the legs or going to the lungs, which can be uh, uh, problematic or extremely dangerous. So this is a risk factor. Again, in medicine, it's all benefit versus risk. So uh, we tell people, uh, generally speaking, to hold the tamoxifen uh, preoperatively. Once they're past the immediate operative window, they don't have a clot, their surgery went well, then we restart it shortly thereafter. So that's what we use for, I would say, the majority of patients in our institution. But I know that in the literature, some people do things differently and a certain level of risks are more acceptable for uh, some than others. This is pretty much the consensus that we arrive to with the, the majority of our uh, uh, oncologists in our center. Okay. Um, Dr. Musgrave, anything on medications that patients need to stop or do you defer to their other physicians? Um, I haven't stopped tamoxifen in my 20 years of practice. I continue it. I use DVT prophylaxis on everybody, mostly pneumatic compression devices, rarely heparin. Um, I, more con I get more concerned about herbals and supplementals and naturopathic medicines if I don't know what those drugs do uh, and I don't do know what they do in context with an anesthetic. So almost any patient who has a significant number of comorbidities or is on a significant number of medications, I will always have them have a pre-admission appointment with our anesthesiologists to talk about what drugs they could stop safely, which drugs may make them bleed a little bit more, like something as simple as garlic pills, which seem completely harmless, can really make people bleed a lot during an operative procedure. Um, so we kind of go through those and those are the ones that I really sort of stop and, and keep my eye on for the most part. The other thing that no one's mentioned, and I think we all do it um, as part of surgical site prophylaxis, we get everybody to wash with antibacterial soap the night before surgery, at least in our hospital, that's the standard of practice. So wash your chest and your abdomen and your armpits with antibacterial soap. And I think that makes a huge difference for patients uh, in terms of them taking some responsibility for surgical site infection. They've done the very best they can do to help with it. Then the rest of it is up to us. I think that's a, that, I did that last one, I just want to emphasize because it's something that's probably not mentioned or quick, you know, on our preoperative instructions, it's a line item that I think is probably missed, but, you know, infection overall is probably our biggest problem, although it happens infrequently, it's the most um, common uh, complication with any surgery. Um, so I think the shower, we, we tell our patients the night before and the morning of, but, but any way you can with a good antibacterial uh, soap designed specifically for that is um, is a very good uh, idea and for sure worth uh, mentioning. And that's not something you need to ask your surgeon about, just do it anyways. Um, no one's going to object to that. Um, you talked about the herbals. I think that's um, really important. I mean, personally, I think we're all on the same page. You know, stopping all of those um, as early as possible before surgery is important because we don't know what they do. The flip side is a question that somebody's asking, is there any supplements or nutritional um, uh, guidance that we can provide preoperatively. Is there anything that you recommend for your patients, uh, Dr. Martu? Uh, nothing specific. Um, I, you know, obviously, I tell them to eat healthy. If there's specific supplements they take, that, and I don't promote bleeding, like Dr. Musgrave was saying, I do take a detailed list of those. And if there's anything, I do ask them to stop it. Uh, but in terms of, you know, I, I tell them it's good to be healthy. Obviously, in an immediate setting, there's only that much you can do. But if it's a delayed, you know, anything with uh, to promote good healing, uh, you know, your vitamins, good protein intake, um, just all around to to um, make yourself as healthy as possible. It's a it's a it's a good thing. Um, so, yeah, not specific ones, but uh, overall, whatever they feel, I will uh, allow them to be in a better state. Does, does anybody have anything specific that they ask patients to start doing um, from a nutritional or supplement perspective? No? Okay. I mean, I for what it's worth, I, I ask my patients to increase their protein intake if they can. I tell them about 30 grams a day, which is about the amount in a protein shake or a protein bar, although I'd prefer if it was from food. Um, and that's really just to, you know, the building blocks of healing. But um you know, that's really the only thing. I think it's more important that you stop taking things that may affect um, outcomes. Um, and the other question on uh, sort of related to that is with regards to exercises. Um, is there anything specific that patients can do to prepare themselves um, physically, whether that's exercise, you know, cardiovascular exercise or specific 
stretches. Um, it looks like there's some questions from patients and also maybe from other physicians that are saying patients often ask about exercises before and, sur before and after surgery. Um, Dr. Musgrave, anything specific on preparatory exercise? I think, you know, the most beneficial thing we can do is walk a half an hour a day. It gives you good cardiovascular exercise. It's shown to help control weight. It's shown to help your well-being. So that's what I say. There's no exercise you're going to do that's going to make your outcome better, except having a nice cardiovascular capacity. Your belly's going to be as big as your belly's going to be. Your back is going to be as big as your back's going to be. There's no exercise to build that up to make things better. Um, and in fact, patients can get themselves in trouble by exercising too early because they want to get back to life and get back to their activities. So I tell people for almost every reconstruction we do, the first two weeks are semi-miserable. Let's be honest. They're semi-miserable. You can't do the things you want to do. You don't have the, all the people around you that you want to have around you. And now with COVID, even more difficult. And sometimes you want to get going. You feel like you should get going. Um, the best thing to do is listen very carefully to your body and follow your, your surgeon's instructions about when to go back to exercise and build up gradually. When they tell you to go back, don't go back and do like a four hour workout at the gym. Go back and do a little walking on the treadmill, lift some five pound dumbbells, something. Start off nice and slow. Don't go burning, you know, full into it. Take your time because every surgery, no matter what it is, will not be healed for an entire year, not just breast surgery, knee surgery, eyeball surgery, whatever surgery you're having. It's a year for your scars to form. It's a year for you to actually get back to where you wanna be. You got lots of time to work out. Take your time, be gentle with yourself and love yourself for those times to get better. That's what we need. We need you just to focus on you, the one and only you, be selfish, take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything to add to that, uh, Dr. Constantine, Dr. Martu? Um, I mean, in terms of exercising, yes, I agree with Dr. Musgrave. You, you can't really burden them a lot. They need to sort of do what it's comfortable. Uh, if we're, um, you know, obviously walking uh, in preparing for surgery, uh, anything they can do, if they want to build up whatever it is that they enjoy doing, whether it's building up muscle strength or whether it's walking, biking, swimming, anything that they enjoy, I think some type of physical activity would be good. Uh, Post-op, I completely agree. Take your time, listen to your surgeon, don't overdo it. The first couple of weeks, you know, take it easy, like Dr. Musgrave said. After that, build slowly. Don't overdo it. You know, patients, we are happy to hear that they're doing well and they want to go to the gym at four weeks, but it's not so happy when they come back with a dehiscence because it's not ready. You know, we tell them like it takes at least a couple of months for the skin to go somewhere 80% of its strength. So take your time. Um, okay. I think um, that's good advice. I know there are some surgeons across the city and across the country um, that have um, physiotherapists involved in the team, um, particularly if patients are inpatients, then they may get some exercise and things like that. I think what we're, what we're all saying is that, um, you know, walking, moving um, to get the, the body going very, very slowly and listening to the body is really important, um, but being too concerned about a very specific exercise routine before or after is probably not necessary. And anything that is necessary, you know, would, would be taught to you by um, your surgeon, or like I said, if you're in hospital, by the by the therapists. Um, there's a, two two good questions that I want to get to. I just want because we only have a few minutes left. I want to um, just tell everybody that's um, watching and listening. There are a lot of questions very specific to procedures and and scenarios um, that patients are presenting, and which procedure might be best for me. And they're really good questions and really important. And I think some of them we're going to try to answer offline and post, but um, have a look at, if, if you're one of those people, have a look at the other sessions. Those questions may be more appropriate to the other sessions. We really want to try to deal with what um, is going to help you prepare for your surgery and not so much on, you know, which procedure might be better, better for you as, as important as that is. So I just want everybody to get a chance to have their questions answered. Um, okay, a question that, you know, I hear a lot and a couple of people have asked here, um, the, you know, a patient uh -huh. is doing a procedure for uh, uh, either it's a flap or fat grafting, something that requires some extra body weight, should they gain weight before surgery? 
What do you tell patients, uh, Dr. Musgrave? So I'm a big fat grafter. I love it. Fat is the best thing that's ever come into my life. I keep a large supply of my own belly fat at all times. Um, body by Kentucky Fried Chicken for people who know me. Um, I think if you need fat and you need a little bit of fat, I think putting on a few pounds to give your surgeon a little bit of extra leeway, I think probably doesn't hurt. But I think most people have donors. If someone's offering you fat grafting, you have donors somewhere. And if you don't have donors somewhere, then we may say to you, listen, maybe you need to put along a little bit of weight before you have this. But uh, depending on how much fat you need, most people have, um, you know, a fat that we can use. Okay. Other, um, uh, Dr. Martu, what about your free flap patients that, you know, just barely have enough? Can they gain enough weight and is that really going to help them to, to have the size reconstruction they want? You know, I've done it before. I've had patients where they needed a bit of weight and it was delayed. And I said, you know, try to put a bit of weight and see where we're going to get. And they did. And I mean, not, not everyone's going to respond the same way. Not everyone can eat more and have it targeted to the area you want. Uh, so a few pounds, fine. It's okay. But again, um, you sort of, you have what you have uh, and you plan based on that. Uh, but yeah, a little bit of weight is okay too. Sometimes you may have to ask your patient to put on, depending on what it is. I mean, you have some people that are very slim and sometimes uh, you, you, you can allow them to do that. And they're very happy to some. Uh, Dr. Constantine, anything different there? I, I try to keep uh, the patients uh, at a good baseline level of health as much as possible. I also tell them in terms of uh, weight fluctuations, uh, I tell them that um, the breasts will change with time and the fat composition of your body changes with diet, exercise, and with age. So your reconstruction will hopefully age well with you. And in instances where the reconstruction is largely made from your tissues, which includes your own fat, that fat is hormonally active. It will, the, the fat cells will become bigger uh, based on your diet or will shrink if, you, if you're dieting more. Uh, if you have an implant-based reconstruction, obviously the implant does not change uh, with your diet, but the tissues around it, especially what's left after uh, a mastectomy uh, or even a lumpe lumpectomy can and will change. So they have to know that even if they have a temporary change in their weight, whether it's voluntary uh, because of chemo, other medications, or, or because of dieting on their own, um, the reconstruction, just like the rest of your tissues, is dynamic. And they have to be prepared that especially if they don't have the same breast on each side, if there are two different reconstructions or if different things were done, there's a cancer side and a non-cancer side. Uh, even though post-op things might be relatively symmetric and they might be happy, things can change at varying rates based on their overall body composition and diet. Okay. Um, okay. So I think it sounds like, um, you know, moderation as all, as we always say is, is the name of the game. I mean, personally, I, you know, I, like what, what everybody has said, I, I look at the patient and see what's realistic. When I get a marathon runner come in and tell me that she'll gain 20 pounds for her surgery, you know, I just say, you know, you're going to lose that 20 pounds right after your surgery. And that's, it, it's going to be there and then it's going to be gone. It's not really going to help you. Um, but if there are little, little, you know, if, if they can help their surgeon a little bit, then that may be um, a reasonable thing. Uh, the um, other question that was asked, and, and I think all of us that spend a lot of time with our patients uh, probably talk about this, but um, how to prepare the people around you. And the, the specific question that was asked, which I think is a really good one, is about intimacy with a partner, right, after surgery. And I think that we can just broaden that a little bit and say, how do you prepare your uh, loved ones, friends, family uh, for what you're about to to go through. So maybe uh, Dr. Musgrave, do you wanna tackle that? So that we could have a whole session on just that because it's more than just your breast reconstruction. It's all the changes that happen with the diagnosis of cancer, your comfort with your body, the medications you're given, your chemotherapy, being shoved into menopause uh, for some women makes a lot of body changes that makes you know intimacy a bit difficult. Number one thing is talk about it. Talk about it with your surgeon, talk about it with your oncologist and talk about it with your partner. When you're ready, then 
and, and you're healed, then I think you proceed as you want to, but don't put it on the back burner. Don't be afraid of intimacy, but make plans for talking about it as your number one priority after your surgery. Um, Dr. Constantine, do you wanna add in general for, for people that surround us uh, after surgery? I think it's, uh, it's very good advice. I, I ask patients uh, as part of my uh, initial consultation uh, and many even later on, because uh, so some relationships suffer very much uh, with, uh, with this disease and changes it makes. Uh, I ask people if they're in a stable relationship and if they would like somebody else to be involved in the decision making, whether it be at home or in the clinic. And it's always helpful when uh, the couple and the people involved reach a bit of a consensus uh, and, and they can kind of bounce ideas off each other. The issue is though that not everybody's in that situation. So then I listen very carefully to what, what the patient is asking me to do. Uh, and I try to give them uh, the best advice accordingly. But I do think like Dr. Musgrave said that um, it's very important to try to achieve some sort of normalcy or get back towards normal. It might not be possible and oftentimes it isn't, but it's important to try uh, because it helps getting over the disease and its sequelae. And at the same time, uh, it'll make you enjoy your reconstruction more, which is the whole point is to improve your quality of life and to be able to do more things and be more comfortable doing them, not less. Great. Dr. Martu, anything to add to that? No, just that I agree with everything that was said. I mean, it's a very personal discussion. I sort of allow my patients to tell me how much they want to tell me. Usually they will ask me after the surgery is done. Uh, you know, a few weeks have gone by and you feel like they feel ready to start being more intimate. And they will ask me, well, is this a good time? Can I have sex now? Or what can I, and then we'll have a discussion and how well healed they are and what is it, you know, their partner might be there. And it's always nice to see them being supported. So it's very personal. I'm open uh, as long as, you know, they're healed and they feel good. And then we can talk about that. Okay. And, and I think again, just to broaden that a little bit, um, just the general concept part of preparing for your surgery is preparing the people around you for surgery and, 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 and uh, again, intimacy aside, just in terms of, you know, the needs that you'll, you'll have from, from preparing food to getting things, you're not going to run out to the drugstore to get somebody uh, to get something, you'll want somebody to do that for you. Um, you know, a lot of um, our patients are highly active uh, people with lots of responsibilities. So trying to, you know, tell your inner circle that you're not going to be available for those responsibilities for a little while um, really takes the, the um, mental strain off, which we talked about and is, and is probably very valuable for everybody because, you know, the patient is going through this and, and it, um, sometimes in isolation and maybe uh, spreading that um, burden a little bit to their circle is helpful. Um, I think we just have a, a minute. So a couple of um, things that people have um, asked. Um, there's a, specific questions about, um, you know, indi contraindications to surgery and things like that. I think I'm going to go out on a limb and say that, you know, there, there's nothing that you should take out of a talk like this or a discussion like this that would say, I can't have reconstruction. I think we would all agree. We, we meet each other at meetings all the time. And, you know, we, you know, I think one of the things that we, and I can speak for all the panelists and the other panels as well, is it's all about the discussion, right? So, so talk to your surgeon, oncologist, even your GP, a uh, family doctor, whoever is in your medical network about um, seeing somebody that knows about reconstruction to get your options because there are a lot of options out there and very few people have no options. Um, so, you know, people are asking if I've had laparoscopic surgery, can I still have a DEP? Well, that really just depends. I mean, the answer would be sure, right? If, I've, uh, if I still want to have uh, children in the future, can I have a DEP? Sure, right? But it's a discussion. Um, I'm just trying to get through some of the um, you know, I have scars on my, on my breasts or on my abdomen from various previous surgeries. Can I still have breast reconstruction? Um, so again, sure, it's a question of, you know, what that option might be and, and perhaps when, you know, is that immediate or delayed? Um, does anybody have any sort of closing thoughts on, on that to, to give people a little bit of uh, strength to go and get those answers? Um. 
I would say the one thing is be informed. If you're having an, a diagnosis right now, make sure you ask for a consultation with a surgeon. I know it's a lot of information and uh, it can be overwhelming, but it's very important to make an informed decision in a timely fashion. And at the time of the diagnosis is a good time to know your options. And, you know, oncologists sometimes may not be aware of all the options. And depending on where you are, there may not be a big team. So make sure you ask for a consult. And obviously in delayed setting, there's more time to decide. There's lots of resources, but in an immediate, uh, it's an individualized approach, so. Dr. Musgrave, any, any final? Everybody can, everybody can have a breast reconstruction. It's a matter of time. And that's why we have Bra Day. We want everybody to be aware there is something for everybody at some point in your journey. When you're ready, come have a consult. You waste nothing by having it and coming in and having something, you'll be able to have all your questions answered. So don't hesitate to come and ask us. That's what we're here for. Dr. Constantine. I think it's very good to have uh, meetings like this ones and forums where people can understand a little bit more. I think a lot of the attendees um, are possibly patients, but there's also some that aren't. And um, breast cancer being uh, uh, what it is and you know roughly one in eight in society that that's a lot of people i think it's very good to know what the options are so you can make the best possible decisions with the information you have at the time and as dr martu said uh, in the immediate setting it, even then uh, it's often quite useful uh, whether you reconstruct or not I, I think it's very good to at least know what the options are and why you made that decision at that moment in time so that uh, you have a lot less regrets and if you choose to make a, a decision later on or a different decision, you also understand why you made that choice and you're not adding uh, to the burden you have to deal with from, from the cancer alone. Okay, so um, I think um, we'll bring this um, to a close just for uh, time, but I, I do want to thank uh, obviously all the organizers. This was a real uh, feat and I hope really, we, I think we all hope uh, really useful for patients ac across the country, specifically our panelists um, on this panel uh, for all the useful um, guidance. Um, we, we, this is recorded and we do have the questions and, and I think it would be really nice to try to get a lot of this information out and it's something that I think we all strive to do. So we'll continue um, uh, to do that, but really encourage patients um, to go out there and, and um, any which way you can, as uh, Dr. Martu said, um, be informed and, and, you know, knowledge is power. And that's for sure uh, true is it in breast reconstruction as it is uh, for anything else. Um, any closing thoughts? Thank you for the attendance. Thanks to everyone. It was great. It was a really good event. Excellent. Okay. So reach out to uh, any of us or your local surgeon for, for information, for consultations and, um, Good luck to, uh, to everyone that's a part of this in their uh, respective journeys. Take care.